Hello. Uh, so, uh, Andy Jackson with Archive of Technical Lead. And so I'm going to do the solar introduction. Um, we have kind of assumed uh, you're all uh, pretty au fait with Waybacks. Uh, Waybacks? The new version? No. Wayback and, and Heratrix. Um, whereas I'm going to try and step back a little bit because I'm assuming most uh, solar is going to be newer um, to most of you. Uh, but it's fairly new to me. So if anyone has any comments or questions, do, do stop me. Um, uh, just to give a bit of context, so uh, as has already come up, we're, we're fortunate to have this architecture. Um, overall, it's be very similar to what you guys do. So you know, we call the web with the curation tools driving that. Uh, but uh, we happen to store our stuff on HDFS, and that's uh, from there we build all of our indexes to, to support playback. What's different about us, um, perhaps, is that we do full text, uh, but as routine, and that this is. Um, I don't think the library realised how unusual doing full text of web archives is. Because it's always been, well, of course you're going to do full text search. How else are you going to find anything? And the fact that uh, very few places do this, fortunately, didn't land on their radar. So we've ended up having to do it, and it's been good fun. So, um, but full text search, well, you know what that means, right? Oh, um, sorry, yes. Is Notchbox dead? Uh, <laughs> I think it's resting. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, it, it's not dead. To, um, the Portuguese web archive is based on it. Um, Nutch itself is is uh, going through something of a renaissance at the moment. It's getting stronger, so I wouldn't rule out it, it gaining strength soon. But uh, it, we chose to go with something else. So, uh, good to hear. The world around Nutchwax has moved quickly in the full text search space since Nutchwax first came into existence. That doesn't mean it won't catch up again. Oh, we're talking about that, that subject. Um, did Elasticsearch pop up in your, because like, yeah. where we are able really want to do Elasticsearch? Yeah, it's a, so again, I, I'll, I'll come to this in a sec. Well, I'll, I'll say it now. Um, <laughs> the, if, uh, okay, let's, jump. so I'll jump, I'll jump forward slightly. So yeah, there's solar, which uh, all our, the reason we use this is we, we, we did it before Elasticsearch even existed, right? Our, our history with solar, my team's history with solar, goes back before my joining the team. And so uh, we're, we're kind of more au fait. Uh, I mean, bits of I think bits of Elasticsearch are in Erlang. Well, you, and um, uh, yeah, I think there was an evaluation before my time, but it was already in place when I came. So that's where we happened to be. And uh, as far as I can tell, the feature parity between them is really quite close. Uh, and pretty much most of anything I say today, you'll be able to achieve with Elasticsearch if that's more politically apposite. One of the big messages I'm going to keep hitting in this is you're going to have to prototype, you're going to have to test, you're going to have to benchmark, and you're going to have to iterate. And if you want to throw Elasticsearch into that iteration, that's a good thing. I'd love to see the results. Uh, we happen to be focusing on solar because that's where we've built up some expertise. It's not, it's not a hard and fast thing. Anyway, so full text search. Uh, that's obvious exactly what that is, right? Well, no. Uh, there are lots of variations and lots of choices to make. So what we've done, and I recommend any of you do, is to work with a user group, uh, some kind of group of users that you can get feedback <coughs> from. The, there's a whole um, kind of information retrieval um, field and research area and journals lurking behind this. But the point is, there are classes of questions your users might be asking. Are they looking for particular resources? I remember this report that the uh, National Health Service published some years ago about X. I want to find that thing. Or slightly more broadly, I want to find a, you know, kind of um, quality resources on a particular subject. But then, what we've mostly been exposed to is a, a rather different question where in some sense, the people we work with, they want to understand the mass. They want to understand the trends in the whole set. They're not really looking for individual documents. They might be, but they're also interested in, in the, the way it reflects the society that they're in. And you, this affects the way you index, right? This affects not just the user interface, not just the presentation, but actually what's in the thing, right, in, at the back. So you have to start to understand what you need and use that to frame your iterations. And then um, pushing towards the user interface, what aspects of the content do they considered important, what facets do they want to see, what do they want to discover, and then what kind of outputs do they want. Ours uh, are very keen on, um, you know, they also want downloads of the result sets so that they can do analysis in other things, you know, that kind of stuff. So you, you'll need to explore that with them as well. They don't necessarily want the one top hit like Google is, is always focused on. So, I'm going a bit too fast, so I'll try and slow down. Um, <laughs> we've, we've, we've had a long, and uh, I've, I've really enjoyed this uh, aspect of our work, a long, quite interesting history on this. Um, with JISC a few years ago, we started the analytical access to the, thank you, Helen, I'll try and slow down, uh, <laughs> analytical access to the Dark Domain Archive project, Catchy. Um, and that was our first index of the historical data set we hold. So this is our, well, JISC's copy of the Internet Archive's version of the UK <laughs> domain. 
and we only managed to index uh, uh, 300 million, three to 400 million resources out of the 2 billion available at that time. Um, but it gave us a start on this road to learn what we need to do to operate this at scale. Uh, currently, we're, how much longer does the Buddha, well, the big data project have left in it a few months? About three months, is it? Yeah. So uh, for the last year or so, and for the next few months, we've been uh, funded by AHRC to uh, do a second iteration of this service. And this has been really nice because we have what, eight bursary holders, something like that, with specific historical questions that they want for their own research, yep. which they're being given early access to what we do for, and they're going to give uh, very detailed kind of concrete feedback on how well or badly what we're doing so far fulfilled their needs. And uh, as I hinted before, um, <coughs> they're an interesting group because unlike the kind of uh, more generic uh, user that a reader or reference library might have in mind, they're very much interested in the set and in how the whole data set reflects a society at the time, right? They're very interested in um, things like, you know, who links to what, when, how that dynamic changes. And that's a lot bigger question than I want in this particular report. So, <coughs> right, uh, I did that. Um, that versus page is quite good if you just want to get an idea but it's mostly green ticks all the way across the the feature parity is really close and we don't uh, really use anything that's different anyway so uh, naughty examples for uh, how we're going to do some indexing I've got three quotes here I'm going to be indexing to be uh, to do is to be Jean-Paul Sartre to be is to do Socrates and dooby dooby doo uh, Frank Sinatra <laughs> so our goals are to I think this is from uh, it's from a novel, and they're not actually the right quotes for those people at all, but uh, it'll, they'll do. Um, <laughs> no, no, they're from a book. I can't remember. They're from a book. Um, who wrote Slaughterhouse Five? What's the author's name? Kurt Vonnegut. Yeah, they're from a, they're from a uh, preface to a Kurt Vonnegut book, I think, but they're not. They're apocryphal. Uh, anyway, so the purpose is to index the quote in a full texty way, e.g., show me all the quotes that contain to be, and uh, index the author in a way that's appropriate for fasted search. So show me all the quotes for Frank Sinatra. I'll try and slow down again because I'm still too. So that's the answer. It's easy. So uh, this is what Lucene does. This is what the library that uh, drives uh, full text indexes does under the hood. It pulls, uh, you take in the quotes, pull them out into separate tokens, and build a big alphabetical index of them. But each of those points to which documents it's in. So B and do uh, are in um, the, all of them. Um, but there's lots of B's and do's in that one, and there's fewer in, in the others. And so uh, if you want to find all the quotes with do in, then you look them up in that. It's, it's just like a CDX file. In Wayback, it's sorted, so you can do nice, fast binary search, and you get, uh, you get the references. And each one of those entries references the identifiers of the documents um, you put in. So, I mean, that's it, really. Well, OK, there's a bit more. Um, Lucene itself uh, exposes, has that capability as a Java library. What Solar and indeed Elasticsearch do is frame that as a service which you can use in a standardized way and it has its own models for scaling and clustering and da -da -da, all that kind of stuff. And uh, in this context, it's probably easiest to think of it as it's being a document database. It exposes that functionality as a thing you can throw documents at, documents made of fields which have different types. And based on the types of those fields, it uh, indexes them in the ways you've told it to, and uh, that uh, then dictates the functionality you can get at query time. So you can think of it as in that OOS terms. Uh, but how do you do a cricket to index the ARC and the work files? Because I, I don't believe that uh, Lucene had this functionality. I'll get to that. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I'll, uh, I'll get to that. Uh, it's probably... Th so, um, yeah, no, I'll do this first. So, assuming you can make those documents, which I'll, I'll, I'll tell you how we do that later. I'll just go through how the actual indexing works. So our documents in this not example, they have some ID, say one, the text field, to be is to do, and then the author. So we're using three types of string, the text, which is a thing called full text index, and another string. Uh, so when you add a document to your document database, the Solar, it, it works like this. So we have a, a client, which does the extraction, which we'll come to. And uh, that creates the, the solar document. And then it, pa it, it passes it over HTTP to uh, a handler. And I'm going to talk a little bit about these analyzers. So this is where you decide the behavior of a type of field. right? And that is a series of tokenizers uh, which <coughs> generates the tokens from the strings, and then some filters which can perform operations on them. 
and it's those things, the fields and the tokens, which are in the which are uh, the things you look up on, which are indexed. Uh, I'll go for an example to try and make that clearer. So uh, the way uh, the indexer I'm going to show you is configured is uh, so uh, we send in to be uh, to do is to be with a full stop. Uh, there's a standard tokenizer um, which we use, and uh, if you look closely, you'll notice that's dropped the dot. So it, it's white space where it assumes white space and punctuation are separators for tokens, uh, but that's all it does. And so you get the five separate tokens, and then we transfer them all to lowercase because we assume our users aren't interested in the case of their search terms. Yeah, it might not be true for your users, but it's true for ours. And then those tokens are what we map. Um, to, uh, and put into the index itself. <clears throat> Similarly with the author field, that's a lot simpler. The string isn't tokenized, it's stored as is as a whole token. And so we end up with a much simpler index where uh, Frank Sinatra points to all of his and, and so on. Because we're not doing full text search on that, we just want to store the field so we can uh, find it uh, verbatim. And the query flow is, is it looks a bit more, uh, looks a bit complicated, but it, it's pretty straightforward, really. So overall, over there, the story is you send in a query and you get a list of documents, fields and values back. Uh, the important thing about the uh, request handler is that it's closely related to the one that you did the updates with. There's usually the same or very similar set of tokenizers and filters in the middle with just a bit of extra logic around to do the query parsing, and it's that which talks to Lucene and then pushes the documents that match back out. That's the overall flow. And so to try and make that a bit clearer, uh, if you search using uh, uh, for, the, for the phrase um, to be question mark, then the first uh, standard tokenizer will throw away the question mark, the lowercase filter will throw away the, the uppercase T again, and then it looks those two tokens up in the index and finds where they are. And then uh, the index also knows the position in the original source document, so it can work out that they're next to each other and so it can return the two documents, which contain two and B next to each other in that order. That's it. Uh, it's even got a UE, so you can play around with it. And you can throw in queries, even quite complicated queries, through there, and uh, look at the results. So, so we're done, right? <laughs> Easy peasy. Unfortunately, you have some more choices to make. So uh, here's a common choice which you'll come across if you read around this area, is whether you should ignore stop words. So stop words are very common words. They're not related to subjects or topics. So if your users are more interested in you know, uh, documents about the NHS or, or, or whatever, or uh, some particular topic, then it's, it can be advantageous to throw these away to stop the noise of those terms polluting the results. I believe all of those are stop words. <laughs> well, exactly, exactly. So if I, pass, if I put a stop words filter in, you start off, you get the standard token as you get to be used to do. Actually, oddly, in the solar default English configuration, do is not a stop word. So everything except the do gets thrown away, so you can no longer do a phrase search on to be, because they've all been flattened down. So our users hate this kind of thing, right? You're, if, again, if your users are more, I just want the document about this particular topic, then they might feel differently, but uh, there are lots of these. So similarly, stemming, which you may have come across, which is where you uh, attempt to uh, guess what, to, well, to group together results which are about the topic someone's searching for. Um, so uh, if they search for fishing or fished or fisher, you'll hit everything. You'll return everything which gets clapped down to fish, and argue, argue, argue. You hit everything that's wrapped, drops, uh, that gets mapped down to the stem. Um, argue. Uh, there are. Oddities in this, it's not, some words can't be stemmed uh, unambiguously. Um, but if uh, uh, the, the, this is a tricky one because uh, our users don't like this, but that means they have to sh search for plurals separately themselves, right? And they're okay with that, but your other users might not be, right? So it, it, there are lots of awkward decisions here about how the audience interacts with what you're indexing so, um, uh, and whether they want total control or a degree of control. Sorry. 
do, do you result then in a, in a, a group of indices? So you have like a stem index, your stem index and your um, stop we, index? We, ideally, we would have, uh, we would multiply index the text in different ways so that we could expose it differently for different audiences. Yeah. However, we're, trouble scale we're having trouble scaling with a single text index. So <laughs> one day... <laughs> so in theory, that's ideal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, the idea will be you can, you can index things in multiple ways within the same stack so then and then expose it differently to different... And let the users choose whether yeah. they want yeah, to stem, whether they want to... Blah, blah, blah. So that then presumes that there's a consequence for the order of your... Now, if you, like, if you stem before you stop, or if yeah. you stop before you stem, you might end up with a different... Yeah, yes, exactly. And so there's a, there's a lot of these filters. Um, so uh, just punctuation, punctuation tokenization. Of course, there'll be language dependencies in here as well. Uh, do you want www.google.com to be treated as three tokens or one? Similar with email addresses and so on. Uh, do you, do you stop words dropped? Do you lowercase? Do you stem? <laughs> Keywords are words which are explicitly exempted from stemming because you know they're important. But that, that's kind of on a two billion corpus, that's kind of meaningless. But if you're doing a focus collection, that's going to make a lot more sense. Uh, synonyms, you're going to flatten those down, possessives, dropping all that. There's loads of these, and uh, uh, they get baked into your database, right, when you do the indexing, and you can't support them all at once. So you're going to have to offer a few options or I investigate which set works best for your language and for your context. And there's even more choices, because that's just building the index. Once you've built the index and you're happy with it, there's lots of lovely query features. Uh, to uh, work with. There's the query parse of it I mentioned, so this controls things like proximity searching for words, wildcards, so using term frequencies, uh, relevance ranking, all that kind of stuff, <coughs> which, uh, and fasted search, which is uh, probably one of the things we've most explored. Um, if you're using numerical date values, you can start to worry about whether you want to do range queries over dates uh, or uh, particular numbers. We have stuff in there to do spatial search. We've not really explored using it yet. But um, we, we, we're doing a bit of that. Can you legally and do you want to support snippets and highlighting? That changes the way you index as well as the way uh, you query. Uh, do you want to offer did you mean spell checking? Uh, a couple of nice features which we've not played with much yet is uh, uh, Solar lets you basically pass a document into Solar and go give me other documents which are like this document based on the way it uses the tokens. And so you can find related documents. What about the in a, in a, I think in the Danish archive we have both English and Danish and maybe other languages in, 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 in the content. How, how, will, how will analyzing the data relate uh, to that? Yeah, so, so isn't it aware of UDF or is it just English? No, no, it has, um, it has different field types for the different languages it knows about. And I think there is a text, uh, I don't know what the right shortening would be, a Danish text thing. Uh, so you can... It's a bit like having a stemmed and a non-stemmed. You can also, if your client can detect when it's Danish or not, yeah. you can send it to the right field, and then it'll be treated differently. It does support multilingual indexes. It's, it's quite, I think it's quite good at that, actually, but I don't know, because yeah, we don't use them much. Um, but uh, I'll get into the, the wrapping in a second. It also, it can, similarly, it can do a clustering analysis. It can look at the terms which are used in a set of documents and cluster that set of documents by the terms within. So you can do automatic clustering of a subset of your results. And that will scale up to a few thousand, I think, out of the set. That's the carrot stuff, yeah. <clears throat> Which is all lovely stuff, but we've only really explored some of the earlier stuff in this. So how to get started, going back to your earlier question. What we're going to talk about in this session, in our sessions and in the workshop, is um, what we've done. So we're going to introduce our archiving stack, uh, which is open source, and you're free to use it. And you're also free to disagree and use something else. But it's just a starting point. Uh, for this discussion, and we also have some in user interfaces. I'm not going to talk about the user interfaces much, um, but there's a list on the wiki of uh, things you can um, start to, to build more sophisticated user interfaces from. I'm going to focus on the indexing uh, side. So, <coughs> the Web Archive Discovery System um, is our use case. It's our choices, right, based on our users who are <coughs> driving these projects. They might not work for you but they reflect our progress so far. And it does what you said. It takes arcs and arcs and it turns them into solar documents and sends them to solar. Uh, the main advantage, which I would uh, uh, at least make you aware of that you'll have to deal with, is it's we've ended up having to be highly robust against data product quality problems in the arcs and arcs themselves. The ones you get from Internet Archive, they're from all sorts of sources. They don't necessarily use GZIP headers correctly. They do all sorts of weird things. 
uh, the, the stuff we're using, say the text extractor using Apache Ticker, that can hang on a bad word document and the code has ended up being extremely defensive and robust. So uh, you'll at least need end to end up copying that out if you don't uh, use the code itself. It's not the most elegant code, so you might want to. <coughs> anyway, yeah, so the point is, uh, it, it's, it's in terms of extracting metadata from um, variable quality source material, it's been very well tested on, on a very large data set. And it adds custom fields to the document that we believe are appropriate in the web archiving case, at least for us. Um, and we'll use this in the workshop sessions as our starting point. And if, uh, it, uh, it, but it, it is, you know, none of, the, none of the decisions it reflects should necessarily dictate what you choose to do. But it's a way of starting a uh, conversation, so to speak. So, what does it extract? <coughs> um, basic metadata fields, the WARC file name and the offset that the record came from from the WARC record headers, the URL, and from that, the host and the domain and the public suffix. That is the bit of the domain you can't, an individual cannot register, so code.uk, com, net, org, um, so that you can facet on that. And the crawl dates, of course. Then, digging a bit deeper from the HTTP headers, it pulls out the content length, the content type as it was served, and uh, if there are server software identifiers in the headers, it'll pull those out too, so that you can facet on them and, and explore them. <coughs> Then the payload itself, uh, it recalculates the hash, and um, Ticker will, ex if it recognizes the type, it'll extract any embedded metadata, so for images, uh, PDF, I think, and a few other things. If there's uh, XMP or other metadata, it'll have a go at pulling it out. Uh, and then um, I, uh, my previous role was purely digital preservation, so I'm quite into format and preservation stuff. So uh, I, it uses Droid as well as Ticker to identify the format and the encoding, and it stores that in a way you can ex expose it from the solar index, it, uh, if either if ticker fails to parse your item, and so it's become undiscoverable because it isn't parsable anymore, uh, which I would consider a preservation risk because you can't even understand it well enough to instruct a text string, then it, it actually puts that in the solar index so you can find them all. Uh, it's capable of using Apache pre-flight to do a PDF risk analysis. Um, if it's XML and, and ticker and droid don't recognize it, it'll pull out the root namespace so that you've got some idea what type of XML it is. And also, there's, it does some stuff with the binary at the start of the file and the file extension. So you can start to do format signature generation, even if it's not in Apache, Ticker, or Droid yet. You can actually create a Droid or Ticker signature from the data. No, it's, sorry. How do you handle ambiguity of Droid when Droid goes here? Uh, pick the first one at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the cases are not that common now. Yeah. Um, it's a lot better than it was. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and um, it must be. They work well in concert, so when Droid is uncertain, Ticker tends to work quite well. Right. But when Droid is sure, down to the version level, it usually beats Ticker, so we kind of combine the two a yeah. bit, and that, that's a nice compliment. Yeah. Um, uh, for HTML, um, we can pull out links, the elements that are used in a page, so you can see when the font tag died. Um, and if we have an initial kind of license or rights uh, URL extraction thing, so you can see Creative Commons stuff in the archive. One more question. What is this uh, Apache preflight PDF risk? All right, so uh, Apache preflight is a PDFA validator, right? So it, it is built to validate P the PDFA format, I think A1. <coughs> so uh, I, this is operating under the assumption that if, if a, a given PDF invalidates, does not validate against that standard, it may be because one of, it's got a preservation risk. So I'll give a concrete example that'll help. One of the constraints of PDFA is that your fonts must be embedded, right? And that's a preservation risk, because uh, critical information you need to render the item is not within the document. So I use Preflight just as a toolkit to spot possible errors with PDFs. Does that make sense? All okay. right. Um, and for images, uh, basic image property can, can be extracted. Uh, there's some kind of experimental code to do dominant color extraction. And also, I hooked in a face detection library. So you, in principle, you could search for faces in the web archive. What libraries are those? What are you using? Uh, the dominant color stuff's my own. The face detection is, oh gosh, I'll have to check the code. I can't remember, it's been a while. But it's, yeah, it, it's there. Um, cool. uh, just to be, might help. Um, it just spots if there is a face in the same way that a camera does. It can't recognize that that's a particular face. So, because that would be worrying. There's some ethical issues. There's already ethical issues in face detection. In facial recognition, there's quite awkward ethical issues. So I kind of, yeah. Does it give you a pixel bounding or just press? Yeah, yeah. So it indexes the, the box in the sub box in the image. As a, as a separate image? 
Uh, no, no, it just it, it puts the boundaries in the solar index so that you could project the subset of the image if you wanted to. Uh, I've, we've not How actually used that in production. <coughs> I've not used it in production yet. I've tested it works and used it on a small sample, but I've not run it we, because we're, we're still having the scaling issues, which we'll get to in a bit. So, um, yeah, there's lots of my ideas in here and not less. Do you have any numbers on the accuracy of the facial detection? Not yet. <laughs> We've not used it at a scale to get significant stats out. I, I, it did once pick up the Wikipedia logo as a face. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> it was just some cropping on the W made it look like eyes. I don't know. Anyway. Just backing up a second, really quick. If you determine that something does have a preservation risk, what do you do about it? Oh, right now it's a case of monitoring to see how severe it is. Um, this, uh, in other contexts within the library, you'd go back to the publisher and say, hey, this is crap. Uh, but we don't, this is a web archive, we don't have that luxury. The thing that's on the web is the thing that was published and you have to record that. So it's more a case of, uh, is there anything we can do about these risks? Do we need to make our code better at extracting? Do we need to, uh, you know, uh, or uh, can we go and get those fonts from the PDFs? It, it's really kind of early stage, can we monitor preservation risks while indexing? Does um, the, the Morris team get it? Uh, they know it exists, but we've not done reports yet. You should. Um. <coughs> that, that's the um, library preservation Yeah. And once you've got the text from the binary format, uh, I can't remember how many binary formats it supports. It's like 10 or 15. Um, so doc and that kind of thing. Um, we compute a fuzzy hash. Uh, this is, it's like a cryptographic hash, but if you change the input a little bit, the output only changes a little bit. So you can use solar to do similarity searching on the text payload within um, the index. Uh, we use uh, Ticker's natural language detector, which is like a trigram frequency or a bigram frequency thing. Uh, it's not great because there's a lot of short text in the archive, but actually if you do things like show me all the French pages which are linking to .fr, it's quite a high quality rate. So it, it does have some use. Um, this is only got, uh, 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 the UK postcode system has a very distinctive textual signature, so we patch those out and turn them into coordinates, which is uh, spatially indexed. We've not actually exposed that functionality yet, but it's there in the index. And there's some experimental stuff uh, for language analysis. Uh, there's a really simple sentiment analysis, which the researchers didn't like at all, because um, <laughs> it's, it's too easy to confuse. Uh, and there's hooks to pull in the Stanford uh, natural language parsing stack and the gate one, um, but they're, they're, they're at the, le the stage of this tends to run out of RAM when we run it at scale, so they're not really <coughs> tested fully yet. Anyway, so, and you run it like this. So um, it's been, the code base has been constructed so that this same indexing heart can be run from the command line or, as you'll see in a minute, on our cluster, and the re results should be the same. We've tried to keep the cluster part separate from the indexer so that it's more easy to test. And that's uh, what we'll be doing later in the week. We'll take some arcs and walks, we can supply some if you don't have any, throw them through the command line thing, set, spin up a local solar, and you'll be able to search your arcs and walks using this stack. So, uh, as it happens, because we're lucky to have the cluster, we have a Hadoop cluster to do this. We throw, uh, take, we take, how many arcs and walks are there in, in the disk? 400,000? 400, yeah, we take the 400,000 arcs and walks in the collection, and process them across the cluster, uh, pull the documents, all the documents together, and push them all into solar. And uh, yeah, not that it's working without any problems, um, but uh, that's what we're doing. Uh, I mention it because that both of these <coughs> modes of use are in the code base that we'll be seeing later. <coughs> so scaling. How am I doing for time? I've no idea what. What, it, it, what did you say? Time? Twenty minutes. Yeah. Am I over by twenty minutes? Then? Oh, good. Right. Okay. Sorry, I, I lost track of when I was supposed to be. Anyway, it's important to understand that compared to the most common commercial and business use case of these tools, certainly solar, we're not really in its what they consider their sweet spot. Uh, you'll often hit advice like, well, what you should have is as much RAM as your index is big in bytes, obviously. Well, frankly, everything's easy if you have that much RAM. I don't have 15 <laughs> terabytes of RAM. So back off. Uh, sometimes people, can, I, I, I'm being honest, because sometimes people can be quite snotty about this on the mailing list sometimes, so you might just be prepared. Um, there's this one guy who's kind of recommending you should only n have no more than uh, 100 million documents per, per node, and it has to be like this. That would be 200 nodes for us, right? That's not going to happen. <laughs> and it's a fool's errand to try and do these heroic efforts. No, it's a perfectly valid use case to rely on disk instead of RAM, but there are a lot of issues to be aware of in our use case. We have, so 
we're, we're an important use case and we're not an unrepresentative use case, but we might not always get the help we need from the broader solar community yeah. because they're used to smaller data sets and bigger budgets. So, how do we scale up? So, um, <coughs> try and do this justice. And we were, Tucker and I were talking about this, uh, that I should introduce this last night. I'm not sure I've done it justice. Anyway, to try and understand what's happening, in a single query, that index I showed you, it's a binary search. It's a binary search that's being performed by a single thread, right? So in some sense, every time you do a single query, it's going to your great big massive index of all of the words in two billion documents, and you can almost think of it as seeking through them. It's not, it's doing a binary search, but it, it's a kind of linear um, uh, single threaded process, right? Per that shard. skips per shard. Yeah, per shard. Um, so <clears throat> the, the point is that it's the seek and the read speed in caching, which is critical to your qu query speed. It's not about CPU, right? and it's not about availability. You could add more RAID and SAN, and we've done that, and you get more IOPS, more uh, capability to uh, support concurrent queries, but individual queries aren't any faster, because basically at the core, you've got these single threads that are going juk, 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 and yeah. Uh, uh, so if you want faster queries, which is our problem, as I'll probably show you if there's time, uh, it's, we're not sure what we're going to do about that yet. We'll, we'll see one recommendation, which we'll probably go with. Um, is, uh, one recommendation is to use SSDs instead of spinning rust, which I think we're going to try. Okay. Um, <coughs> uh, oh, don't worry. <laughs> it, it's okay. it's uh, <laughs> reassuringly expensive. Um, <laughs> no, we'll, uh, the order will be on your desk in the morning. Um, and then, uh, or, and or, you, uh, give more RAM so they can cache more of the index. The operating system can cache more of the index so that improves the read speed um, okay. of the system. So, so some combination of these things, and of course, is uh, cloud solar cloud supports sharding. So you could split the data into more smaller shards on independent media, and that will also get your speed up. So it's some combination. Uh, the guy on the mailing list is at this end where he's going, you want 200 shards with 32 gig, but don't worry about anything else. And um, we're having to work somewhere more in the other area uh, because of our um, use case. Quick question. <coughs> uh, with today's... Uh, do you have any numbers on the average uh, query time? How long does an average query take? Uh, yes. Um, so w what we'll get to later in the day is um, benchmarking using queries, which are representative, hopefully, of your users' queries. And um, you c we use that to estimate averages and uh, variances in queries. But it's very dependent on your configuration and setup. So um, does that? Answer your question. Not yeah, really. I was, do you have? Is it? Uh, do you talk about milliseconds, seconds? Oh, I see. Seconds? Well, um, unfortunately, on our current production index, it's it's very much seconds, and uh, it's probably uh, the average is probably near ten seconds. But we have very forgiving users. I think we can do better than that. But you won't be getting millisecond uh, response times unless you throw a lot of nodes at it. Right. So if uh, yeah. We'll probably return to that in the afternoon-ish. Do you make a separation in the performance <coughs> from the ingest and indexing operation and then the query resolution um, operation? And I guess the final question really for me would be, can you then abstract all of your index and give it to a, a another system to <coughs> make all your indexes and then consume them? And produce, does that make sense? Like, yes. So as you'll see, um, uh, the, uh, this is one of the, so uh, Tokyo from uh, uh, Danish Group is, is going to um, uh, explain his. We have so far been using the same cluster to index and, and to then to query, and that has pros and cons. And then Tokyo has been using a separate machine to build shards and then put them into the query system. Right. And that's pros and cons, and we, we're probably going to consider doing that. Okay. But this, the size of shards you choose is... Um, is dependent on the on your overall kind of query needs, you know. So it, they're yeah. kind of coupled. You can't totally separate yeah. them. Yeah. But but, but the, <coughs> the indexing is massively parallel on machines. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. 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 It, it is not our bottleneck in any way. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, our bottleneck is building the indices yeah. uh, so that they're performant on the right size. Yes. Right. So. Okay. Um. <coughs> so uh, solar cloud the, uh, is built into solar, and that supports uh, sharding. So uh, generally, there's a kind of recommendation that. Uh, if you're over 100 million documents, you want to start using shards. It can't cope with more than 2 billion shards, right? It'll break if you have, yeah. Um, so uh, we're in kind of that range of having a few hundred million in each shard. 
and uh, this allows more parallel activity, more independent lookups at the same time, so it gives you faster search. Um, and as I was just hinting at, there are two ways of building these shards. We've gone with the solar out of the box way, um, perhaps because we didn't know any better, but perhaps. Uh, it, well, our, our use case kind of pushed us this way. Um, in this case, uh, you, uh, solar comes with its own recommendation for how to use it at scale, and you, push doc uh, you ingest documents into the same system you use for querying. Uh, and it's good in that um, it randomly distributes the records, it lo you know, does load balancing kind of thing. And it also means we can update records relatively easily because it's a live index that does reads and writes. However, um, what the danger done, talk about later, is uh, the kind of manual sharding where you map a set of arcs and walks onto uh, a, a shard and build that separately and then put it in and then take the next set. Sorry? We are talking uh, Solar 4, aren't we? Yes, this is so I am assuming Solar 4. Yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, that's true. <coughs> um, yes, so, uh, and in that case, you can't update the contents easily because you did it in a different process. It's not, you're not using Solar's way of distributing documents across the, across the, the, the shards. Uh, and uh, that's about as far as I want to go on that right now. <laughs> well, it'll come up again later. So, uh, as I said at the start, um, you're going to have to prototype, prototype, prototype. Uh, you expect to re-index your content mm -hmm. over time. Um, expect to iterate your front and back ends as you kind of learn the capabilities and your needs. And I do seek real user feedback if you can, because that really helps steer the quality of the experience. Um, <clears throat> and as we'll I'm getting to what we'll talk about a bit later, benchmark, benchmark, benchmark. Uh, the size of your collections and your needs will dictate uh, the kind of hardware and the kind of infrastructure you need. So um, we've kind of sl tried to slowly grow up and there have been pains, but we're getting there. And so we'll cover a bit more on scaling issues and benchmarking later on. And also, uh, I, I was partially responsible for kind of pushing for this event. And I, I feel like um, this group of people has a shared use case within the kind of solar elastic search, e either toolkit, it's very much a shared use case. And uh, there's a potential a uh, lot for us to gain by sharing use cases, sharing our indexing tactics, uh, sharing system specs and benchmarks, and uh, sharing code where appropriate. We're always happy to share our code. Um, uh, if you're not, that, that's totally fine. But please use ours if it's of use. No lunch, and, uh, no sharing, no lunch. No sharing, no lunch, Helen says. <laughs> okay, <laughs> right. That's, uh, that's something I can get, I can get behind. Um, uh, so yeah, that, that's me. I a question about uh, benchmarking. Yes. Are you benchmarking against different configurations or indexes in within Solar, or are you benchmarking that against different implementation, or against, for example, different technology like Elastic Search? So what are you Well, hmm. Tell us a That's it. Yeah. Uh, our motivation right now is to have a benchmarking script, which is broadly representative of real usage, user usage, mm -hmm. and use that to check each thing we're going to have to change about our index, there's lots of other choices to make, yeah. and see how they affect the results. So we can do com change one thing, compare, change okay. one thing, compare. Yeah, In I'm principle, saying. the same suit could be used to check the same use case across different platforms, but there's a lot more variables then. So it's, it's harder to know what you're learning, but it still might be of use um, to see, you know, I think we're going to do some kind of SSD versus hard disk thing. So we, but if you try and change one thing, then the, the results will be easy to interpret. Did you not feel that <coughs> there are too many choices? There are a lot of choices, which again is, I think, why we need to support each other a bit, because there's an awful lot of wrinkles um, in the stack, and uh, there's a lot of tricks and a lot of features, and um, it's it's hard to know it all, and we've learned a lot, um, and but Will's missing, and you know. So. Operationally, do you not feel the need to re-index continuously is actually uh, is that an issue? It. Yes. I mean, uh, there is, if, if you, um, other institutions mm -hmm. have taken a very, um, they kind of treat the OIS model, the kind of three steps, oh, you, you, you pre, you, pre, you ingest, and then you store, and then you access, and, and taking it very much to heart, so they end up with stuff on tape, say, mm -hmm. uh, because that's very cheap and very uh, effective. You can't re-index everything all the time if it's on tape, right? It's too costly. <laughs> We're lucky, my institution has always imagine they would have to re-look uh, at stuff at least frequently. So all of our stuff, even in the big library system, the, the, the kind of nearly two petabytes thing, is on spinning disk. So we could pull it out quickly. So there is a certain degree to if... So 
right now we expect to re-index a lot because no one's got a clue really of how to index web archives effectively. But even when we've got that, the web indexing will just get better and smarter. And this doesn't just apply to web, this will apply to digitized media as well. OCR gets better, all of that kind of stuff. So that does mean you really need the stuff on a performant enough platform that you can go back and reprocess it. And so yes, in that sense, it, it, th there's a push between if you limit yourself to very slow, very remote storage, you won't be able to do this stuff and get iterations out to your users quick enough to get feedback. Da, 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 da. So there's an interplay. Does that answer question? Yeah. Do you have a feeling for the weight of the index as a ratio of the original content? Yeah, uh, with all of my experimental fields switched on, which I wouldn't recommend, it gets up to 15 or maybe 20% of the walks and arcs, but it's usually down around 10 okay. if, uh, if you don't switch on all the, all the widgets. I have a question. How, how do you represent the re uh, search results? Of course, okay, you have a list. <coughs> and when the user clicks that, uh, then it gets directed to open way back? Or yeah, so that depends on the, on the context. So for this collection, uh, I'll, I'll see if I can do it. Oh, good, I like harmful. <laughs> <coughs> this is where you get to see how slow our index is. So this is our live. <coughs> but I'll talk. It'll be fun. Oh, it's not even working. What have I done? <coughs> That's weird. Is that busy? No. I, I wonder if we're not IE compliant, actually. Uh, who wants to be IE compliant? <coughs> anyway, um, I've, this this bug is uh, this uh, error has thrown me so much I can't remember what the question was. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> How do you display results? Oh right, yes. So um, yeah, uh, for this collection uh, we have a fasted search interface, which I would show you if it worked, and um, we uh, redirect these users to the Internet Archive to go and look at it. Because uh, it's good. yeah, it's in a it's a contractual requirement of the the data set that we uh, borrow from Internet Archive that we host uh, for JISC oh, okay. from Internet Archive. Um, so it is possible because of the way Internet Archive obey robots.txt retrospectively, it's possible you could find a result in our index that you then couldn't go and look at yeah. because it's currently blocked by the current owner of that host, which is unfortunate, but it's the best we can do mm -hmm. in the kind of legal area that this data set exists in. The, the content requirement there is that you have the content, but, but you can't you can, send the same yeah, you, can, you have the content, you can uh, make available extracted data sets from it, derivable, whatever, you can do whatever about it, apart from <coughs> providing local access to the work that it is. Whereas in our permissions-based selective archive that's been running since 2004, you can just direct people straight to the UK Web Archive, and in the legal deposit collection, you'd have to repress. Oh, that wasn't that slow. Um, you'd, you'd have to. Uh, uh, I did search earlier though, so it might be the caching. Um, uh, uh, sorry. Anyway, so, so this is our kind of. It's a bit hideously complex, but this is our interface, and this is what the results look like. So I'll just sort by the call date, <coughs> and uh, what. Uh, You'll find I like capture. It's a new word that uh, came into use since this corpus was collected. It didn't exist before 2003 on the web um, because the concept didn't exist until 2002. And you can find its first crawled echo on the web from this interface. It's not actually the first published article because you get the crawl date, not the published occasion date. Mm -hmm. But it's really early. And from here, you can dig back to the first UK reference, which is on register.co.uk, I think. Anyway, so. So I like that because it, 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 it comes up new. And you can, um, you can see who talked about it, who talks about it the most, which domains uh, are usually linked to when the word capture appears. Well, google.com, because they're hosting most of the captures, presumably, and that kind of thing. And so these are all facets you can, um, you can hone down on. So uh, there's only 73 mentions <coughs> of capture in this corpus, this 2 billion, um, from 2003. And you can poke around in there and have a look at what's going on if you like. So anyway, so that's our interface, and yeah, it's slow, but our users are willing to put up with it, um, and uh, we're using it to give us feedback. Any uh, any more questions? Cool. Thank you. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Real quick. Uh, is there a way in Solar to maybe add temporary exclusions as we may do in Open Wayback, or should uh, we update an index? 
you you kind of have to do that in the client. So this is this the user interface client would have to honour that exclusion. I think. Oh no. You can. To, I think uh, the way you guys do, I think, in, in, is you can add, you could you have to change your client to add the exclusion to the results. So if you can't take anything from this domain, then you'd have to change your client to modify the query so that results from that domain are excluded. Uh, that's the quickest thing to do. And then if you're sure you want to take them out, then you could delete them. But you can't just kind of temporarily kind of uh, switch them on and off easily. <coughs> See, now it's hung. Anyway. We don't know. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. So it, it's, it's um, yeah, on our current setup, the variance in query time is massive. So the average might be under 10 seconds, but it goes up to 100 sometimes when it has a bad moment. Anyway, sorry. Any more uh, questions? Um, yeah, should we move on? All right. Thank you. Thank you.